Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. I appreciate you tuning in and joining me in the practice of seeing the world through the lens of integral theory, which posits that consciousness and its collective manifestation culture are evolving. And not just evolving, but evolving toward a magnetic pull of goodness, truth, and beauty, which are paradoxically often advanced by means of a lot of their opposite. In other words, a lot of bad, scary, ugly things. Which brings me to the topic of, I guess, most conversations, virtually all conversations these days, and that is the coronavirus. I did a podcast a couple weeks ago, A Plague Arrives, about the virus and um, its evolutionary impact as I think is just pretty obvious. There's more to come, and it's going to be fascinating to sort this out. But a general deepening of the groove of world centrism in that the whole world is focused on this. And that in itself is significant. And I talk about that. And then also this collective action that I find has been astonishing. One could argue it's too late and it's flawed and it is, it's the mess of evolution, but it's remarkable to me how in our culture war with the left and right, we have that modern middle. We have the postmodern left, we have the traditionalist right. And the scientific rational middle is winning in the sense that people really are capable of effective collective action, which is the only thing we have in fighting this virus. So I talk about that. But today I wanted to be a little more personal and, you know, acknowledge that here we all are, you know, some of us at home, some of us venturing out knowing this virus is real. Uh, Some of us have gotten it, gotten the diagnosis, have loved ones who have. And it brings up the big predicament (laughs) that we human beings have found ourselves in since we woke into self-consciousness, and that is that we realize that this self that we are is going to die. And I hate that part. (laughs) And it's scary. You know, you can feel it. So the coronavirus brings all this into an immediacy that we don't normally experience. But it wakes us up to a reality that death is all around us anyway, you know, and that the death rate remains stubbornly fixed at one death per person, and we all have to do it. Now, it has been the intuition of all people in all cultures and brought forth by great saints and sages, this realization that there is a dimension of reality that is bigger than the self, that the self is arising within it and is interpenetrated with it, and that we actually have an identity if we awaken into it with this reality beyond ourselves, beyond time and space itself, and it's the part of us that doesn't die. And that, you know, touching that is the preoccupation of religion and philosophy and a whole lot of art. And it is really helpful. You know, it's there for a reason. And it's not just because it keeps us from going insane, or it gives us ways to bond more deeply with each other, even though it does both those things. But let's say it's also just true that we are arising in a larger reality that we can realize. And when we do, we are bigger, better people. 
And that's not something you can get talked into or out of. It's something you practice and realize or sometimes just spontaneously awaken to. And that's why the practice of, of dying before you die or contemplating your death is at the core of so many spiritual practices. And it is a powerful practice. The idea is not to wallow in death, although sometimes you do that, but to see the part that then doesn't die. It's like one of my favorite meditations from when I was in the divinity program at Naropa was the uh, when we were learning about the Indian practice of the charnel ground meditation. And the charnel ground meditation is when these monks would go and sit in the uh, places where they threw the dead bodies of people who died. And they would rot and the crows would come and eat them and the scavengers. And they would sit and contemplate their hand and the hand of a decomposing corpse and the skeleton and then their hand. And we would do that practice, you know, as a visualization, not with real corpses, but it's a contemplation of who is this subject contemplating this decaying object? Who is this larger self? And it's actually got me interested in this new burial technique that is legal in Colorado, where it's just, it's a natural burial where they wrap you in a shroud and put you in the earth and no embalming. And um, you do it quickly. And, um, you know, you, you rot in a natural way. So I think about that and I, I like it, you know. I, I think of that song as a kid. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the ants play pinochle on your snout. And um, yeah, the alternative was to rot in a casket slowly or to be incinerated. That's quick. You got to give it that. But anyway, so I'm thinking about these things and it's not all bad. In fact, I'm enjoying it. So. That's one of the things I'm doing. The other one is as I'm laughing and I'm again, you know, the ingenuity of human beings and this web and internet where everybody gets to express themselves. And, you know, in some ways the, the, the cream rises to the top with likes and attention and virality. This is a good virality. There's a community on Reddit called Stand Up Shots where young up and coming comedians post themselves or their manager does, or one of their fans, I don't know how it works necessarily, but they post a picture of themselves. They post a picture of themselves with one of their jokes. And there's a couple of made me laugh. First is from one of my favorites, Alpa Capone. And he says, America needs 40,000 ventilators. And Trump is like 30,000 ventilators. What do you need 20,000 ventilators for? <laughs> this re reality distortion machine that is Trump. Uh, the next is from Brandon Alejos. And he says, if McDonald's does not use this time to fix all their ice cream machines, then this was all for nothing. And for those of you who occasionally sneak a McDonald's ice cream Sunday, you know what I'm talking about, or what he's talking about. Uh, next is from Seb Fazio. He's funny. Drake was just in quarantine. Drake, a pop star. Drake was just in quarantine. The seventh team he's been in this week. <laughs> so, yes, God bless the comedians. Okay, moving on. One of the things I love about developmental theory is that it invites us to re-inhabit our entire evolution. Just as our psychotherapeutic practice often has us do as individuals to relive our childhood and to feel into what it was and how it felt and who we were. 
And so we do that as a practice with our collective human heritage. And so to that end, I have been contemplating and enjoying myself some poetry that comes from different, that strikes different notes in the chord that is humanity. One that keeps coming back to me, and I love it for its simplicity, is from Tagore, a Indian sage of the early 20th century. And he wrote beautifully about death. And the line that sticks with me is, because I have so loved this life, I know I shall love death as well. How about that? Because I have so loved this life, I know I shall love death as well. And it, it invites us to this bigger I, you know, the one that doesn't die, the one that the small I, the small self is arising within. Some of the most beautiful poetry about death comes from red and tribal, where you see yourself in the lineage of your ancestors, and they're as alive as you are in your world, and you will join them in one way or the other, or become a nature spirit, or, you know, some sense of being one with the land, the world, one's ancestors. So here's an example from the Red Warrior culture. It's a poem attributed to the Vikings. It's a description of Valhalla, and I'll share it now. Lo, there do I see my father. Lo, there do I see my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Lo, there do I see the line of my people back to the beginning. Lo, they do call to me. They bid me take my place among them in the halls of Valhalla, where the brave may live forever. Yeah, yeah. I love that you know, expanding to feel, you know, the connection to time and space and land and people. And um, here's a contemporary example of this that I received from my sister last night. Uh, and it's a viral piece of women physicians in Canada who have a choir and they're singing now in separation. And I'll show it, you can see it, but you'll hear it at any rate. And it's a song about that very identity, uh, but this time in a way that's world-centric, that includes all people, and indeed all of the natural world. It's called We Rise Again, and here's a clip. So yeah, what a beautiful expression of that age-old idea that we're part of the web. Okay, so I said that this intuition that there is more to life than meets the eye is something that was true for all people of all times and places, and that's actually not true. The exception being our time, modernity, where reality is collapsed into the exteriors, only things that we can see and measure and so forth. It's materialism of science. Not all scientists are that. But, you know, 
if you read the bestseller list uh, from Sam Harris to Steven Pinker to Steve or Brian Greene to uh, Nuval Harari, they're all materialists. And Dawkins, of course, you know, we're big lumbering robots. Nothing more than several octabazillion atoms that have decided to come together and be us for a while, for some reason. There's a poem that comes out of modernity, a great modern poet, Robert Frost. And it's a modern take on death and annihilation, fire and ice. And it always blasts me open in a little way. So I'll share it with you. Fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I'll hold with those who favor fire. But if the world should perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. As the little black dog enters the room. <laughs> yeah, so a, you know, precise, unadorned, no syllable wrong, you know, poem. The story goes that he had been talking to a famous astronomer who was at Harlow Shapley, and he asked him about the end of the world. And Shapley said that either the sun will explode or the earth will slowly freeze. Take your pick. So thus comes this beautiful poem about either way is good. You know, no big belief system, no big hoopla. And, you know, modernity often gets critiqued as in denial of death. And I get that critique. But, you know, people get that there is death. What modernity brings, or in a way feels like it subtracts, from what all of previous humanity took for granted was that our life meant something. And that there was something beyond this life that we could actually wake up to in this life. Uh, not so modernity. So I think Frost, as you know, a great artist that he was, is critiquing this. I mean, he's observing this process of disenchantment with a wry amusement that actually undermines it. And it's just a beautiful poem that always sends me, so. All right, so if we continue to walk through human evolution through to the postmodern stage, I'll share a poem from that stage that I love. Uh, it's written by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and it's about Allen Ginsberg. And both of these guys were great postmodern poets. They were part of the disembodied or school of disembodied poetics at the at Naropa back before my time. And, um, and this is about the death of Allen Ginsberg, and it's written by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and it's called Allen Ginsberg Dying. Allen Ginsberg is dying. It's all in the papers. It's on the evening news. A great poet is dying, but his voice won't die. His voice is on the land in lower Manhattan in his own bed. He is dying. There is nothing to do about it. He is dying the death that everyone dies. He is dying the death of a poet. He has a telephone in his hand, and he calls everyone from his bed in lower Manhattan. All around the world, late at night, the telephone is ringing. This is Alan, the voice says. Alan Ginsberg calling. How many times have they heard it over the long, great years? He doesn't have to say Ginsburg all around the world. All around the world and the world of poets, there is only one Allen. I wanted to tell you, he says. He tells them what's happening, what's coming down on him. Death, the dark lover, is going down on him. 
His voice goes by satellite over the land, over the sea of Japan, where he once stood naked. His voice is on the waves. I am reading Greek poetry. The sea is in it. Horses weep in it. The trident in hand like a young Neptune, a young man with black beard standing on a stone beach. It is high tide and the sea birds cry. The waves break over him now and the sea birds cry. On the San Francisco waterfront, there is a high wind. There are great white caps lashing the Embarcadero. Alan is on the telephone. Horses of Achilles weep in it, here by the sea in San Francisco, where the waves weep. They make a sibilant sound. They make a sibylline sound. Alan, they whisper. Alan. And you see the, you know, beautiful, you know, certainly not worrying about wasting syllables, just a sort of a stream of consciousness, emotional, subjective, not meticulous, not efficient. And that is a, you know, that's the great postmodern deconstruction of the suffocating realities. <laughs> or worldviews that, uh, you know, humanity has been in one way or the other gripped by. So good job, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Allen Ginsberg. And, and then the last thing I'm going to share is a poem that I think expresses the integral, or an integral sensibility about death by one of my favorite poets, and a lot of people's. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, I think, 93, what is it, 96. Uh, Wisława Simborska, a Polish poet, now passed on. And um, this is her poem called On Death Without Exaggeration. It can't take a joke find a star, make a bridge. It knows nothing about weaving, mining, farming, building ships, or baking cakes. In our planning for tomorrow, it has the final word, which is always beside the point. It can't even get things done that are part of its trade. Dig a grave, make a coffin, clean up after itself. Preoccupied with killing, it does the job awkwardly, without system or skill, as though each of us were its first kill. Oh, it has its triumphs, but look at its countless defeats, missed blows, and repeated attempts. Sometimes it isn't strong enough to swat a fly from the air. Many are the caterpillars that have outcrawled it. All those bulbs, Pods, tentacles, fins, trachea, nuptial plumage, and winter fur show that it has fallen behind with its half-hearted work. Ill will won't help. And even our lending a hand with wars and coup d'etats is not far enough. Hearts beat inside eggs. Babies' skeletons grow. Seeds, hard at work, sprout their first tiny pair of leaves, and sometimes even tall trees fall away. Whoever claims that death is omnipotent is himself living proof that it's not. There's no life that couldn't be immortal, if only for a moment. Death always arrives by that very moment too late. In vain, it tugs at the knob of the invisible door. As far as you've come, cannot be undone. Wow. In vain, it tugs at the knob of the invisible door. As far as you've come, cannot be undone. The, the, the story here is life, you know, 
life triumphs over death because we're still here. Look at us. Every life is a testimonial to that. And also that there's a, you know, growth in here that as far as you've come cannot be undone. You take what you learned here, what you gave here, how you grew here with you and some way that is defiant of death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Wislawa Siborska. All right. So I think I'll end with a spiritual exercise that we used to do back at Boulder Integral with groups. And it's sort of a systematic way of practicing dying where you identify things that you love in your life that you're going to have to say goodbye to. So a favorite activity, a favorite place, people that you love, a pet, and identify five or six things. And finally, your own self, your own body. And write each down on a little piece of paper, its own little piece of paper, and fold them up. And then put them in your lap. And we would do this as a group exercise. Open one up and contemplate saying goodbye to that in death, because that's what we got to do. This is the exercise of dying before we die. And as you contemplate that, and we would give people a couple minutes, and at the end of this contemplation would be to drop that piece of paper on the floor and, you know, surrender. And you do that through the place you love and the thing you love to do and the people that you love and your own body in the final act. And, um, and you're left with an open space. And, but you're still there. <laughs> There's still awareness itself in the form of you. And so you contemplate that. And then you get to go and pick up piece by piece the things that you dropped because you're not dead <laughs> and you get to have them back. And there's just something that is so um, liberating about removing what we love from the confines of time and space and find its timelessness. And with the beautiful things that we have learned and gained, not in their form, but in their, you know, non-material essence. And I don't know how that goes. That's why, you know, all I can do is bring faith, which is, you know, not belief necessarily, because I don't know, I might be wrong <laughs> about all of this. Maybe the materialists are right, the lights go out. Uh, but I don't think so. And the, to the degree that I don't think that, I feel like a more alive person. And, you know, I'm not going to be reasoned out of that. Um, and I think that there is, you know, that's what, there's, that's what lies beyond modernity. And post-modernity is making its own stab at re-enchanting the world. But at Integral, we take that seriously. And part of where we look is, to back to when it was enchanted and what was good, true, and beautiful about that. And a lot of it was the contemplation of our own mortality in the service of waking up to our immortality. Okay, thank you again for tuning in to The Daily Evolver. Stay tuned and we'll see you next time. <laughs>